Westwood Unitarians <clears throat> respectfully acknowledge that we live, work, play, and gather today on Treaty 6 territory, a gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others who have deep and lasting ties to Amiskwachi, Waskegon, and surrounding areas. Their histories, languages, and cultures continue to nurture and influence our vibrant community. Towao, bienvenue, welcome. What I love about the word towao is it means not only welcome, but there is room here. And yes, there is always room here for you, whether you've been coming since the mid 80s or whether you've just come for the first time. We want you to know you are welcome here, either in person or our friends who have joined us on Zoom. Now, we also hope that you have a few minutes to stay after the service because, thanks to our good buddy David, there will be beverages served, hot and cold usually, beverages served over in that corner of the room, and you're most welcome to take one and join in some friendly conversation afterwards. As Unitarian Universalists, we affirm, affirm and promote respect for the inter interdependent web of all existence, of which we are all a part. Westwood is a nurturing, inclusive community where we encourage free thought and all people are invited to rest, grow, and serve the world. This morning, we are planting seeds of hope and inspiration together with Lindsay McWhorter and members of our choir Harmonia as service leader. Upcoming services and events are posted on our website where you can subscribe to have new posts delivered to your email. If you'd also like to receive the weekly announcements sent from the office, please sign the guest book on the table at the back and include your email address. Next week, we will have Rob Wisnerna here. He will be leading a May Day celebration of the contributions and struggles of workers in words and music, I'm sure. It's Rob, there will be music. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Our next song is called Morning Has Broken, and it is uh, actually based on a, Sco a Scottish folk melody from a couple, or almost 150 years ago. Uh, the poet, uh, it was an English poet and a children's author who was 
either commissioned or asked to create a poem that would go with this song. And it was to, um, to mainly have uh, children sing about um, a new beginning every day. So, and to give thanks for every new day that we have. Candles of Joy and Concern is a moment in our week that gives us the opportunity to hear and express something important that's going on in our lives and the lives of those around us. To celebrate what's, what brings us joy and the things that are weighing heavy on our hearts. Lighting a candle is a way of showing solidarity with the person or a special moment the candle is being lit for. For those of us who are online, can we go to our online folks? There they are. <laughs> so please, um, online folks, raise your hands. Anyone who has something they'd like to share, a candle to light? Nope. OK, nice to see you anyway. <laughs> um, and now for those in the building. So you're invited to come up, come forward and speak, and then light your candle as the next person speaks, or to light a candle in silence. We are also happy to bring the microphone to you if you wish. And um, I think it's time for us to sing happy birthday to all of the April birthdays. How many do we have? Can you hold up your hands? <laughs> Nobody? My granddaughter Amelia. Yay, Should Amelia. Okay. Sarah, okay. Yes. Okay. And um, actually, apparently, Buddha was born on April 8th, so... Yeah. And I will now light one final candle for all the joys and concerns that remain unexpressed in our hearts. So please join us for the affirmation on the screen. Mm. 
May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. All right, I have a little story for you now. As a family drove home after church, a parent was complaining about everything. They said, the music was too loud, the sermon was too long, the church announcements were unclear, the building was hot, the people were unfriendly, they went on and on complaining about virtually everything, but not the coffee, because they were here, maybe. Okay, <laughs> finally, an observant child piped up. Well, you have got to admit, it wasn't bad show for just a dollar. <laughs> so I'm going to call on Dean to be my Vanna at the back there. Dean, could you point, uh, maybe if, if you're able to stand up and just point at that blue box in the corner? Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. There's Dean. And beside that blue box, there are some envelopes and a pencil. And we do our best to make everything at this community accessible for everyone, including by keeping all of our programs as free as possible. And we do that through the contributions of our volunteers and the financial contributions of members and friends. That is the only way that we can exist. And so if you are able and willing, um, there are several different ways to contribute. You can contribute your time and your energy. If you're able to make a financial contribution of any kind, that box is always available with the little envelopes beside, and you can get a receipt for a charitable donation. Or you can do it via Interact, or you can make a monthly contribution. There are a multitude of ways. Just if you have questions, ask after the service. But Mostly, I just would like to say this is also a time in our service where we take a moment to continue the thinking, um, the expressions of gratitude. You've heard many expressions of gratitude during the candles this morning. And I'd like you to just pause and take a moment to think about what other things you have to be grateful for. And now we will sing our song. From you I receive, to you I give. Together we share, and from this we live. So um, my introduction is very short. I have to congratulate Margaret on hers, all the research. Uh, now it's time to sing a beautiful spring song, number 63. Spring has now unwrapped the flowers. So please stand if you can and wait for the piano introduction.
my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker this morning, our own Lindsay McWhirter. Lindsay has been a member here at Westwood for all of this century and maybe even a little of the previous one. Thanks. You're so welcome. <laughs> Lindsay's always taken an interest in our gardens and grounds. And she's the one that brought the Plant a Row, Grow a Grow program to Westwood. In the past, she has worked so diligently at times that she's burned herself out. And she'd have to invoke the rest from our rest, grow, serve motto. Well, we're so fortunate that she's always been, been able to rise again. Lindsay is a dedicated dynamo with high ideals, which she lives into. She definitely walks the walk. Come on up, Lindsay. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I got some email from uh, one of the organizations that I follow. It's called Seed Change. And it uh, let me know that Friday was International Seeds Day. And considering that my being here is sort of an accident, I think, because of a cancellation, it, the timing is quite serendipitous. I just wanted to read you a little bit. Um, Powerful Seed. On International Seeds Day, we acknowledge the power of the seed, the farmers who sow them, and the seed keepers who safeguard their diversity. Seeds are the very heart of the vitality of our planet. They hold the genetic blueprint for plant life, providing the foundation for our food, ecosystems, and biodiversity. Without them, our food systems would collapse. Seed Change works with a small scale with small scale farmers and seed growers in Canada and globally to ensure that local seed systems are resilient and thriving. This work aims to preserve varieties, increase seed diversity, and facilitate knowledge sharing among farmers so they can access and grow the seeds they need. Seeds also hold significant cultural heritage. They carry stories, traditions, and knowledge passed down through generations. Many seeds are deeply intertwined with the cultural identities of communities, representing their history, rituals, and ways of life. By preserving seeds, we also preserve the cultural heritage embedded within them. And for those who don't know, Seed Change is the new name for the Unitarian Service Committee, which many of us of my generation heard a lot of advertisements by Lada Hitchmanova. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that's where it comes from. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, when I first agreed to do this service, and, and by the way, I'm kind of not a digital person yet, uh, so pardon the paper. Uh, when I first agreed to do this service about a week and a half ago, I was basically going to talk about our garden, uh, what is planned, you know, what's been done in the church gardens and what's going to happen this year and in the years to come. But then thanks to Don and, and some other friends, I decided I should maybe talk about my personal journey. I'll start with a bit of my history of gardening. I grew up a few blocks south of here on a quarter acre of land um, in a 700 square foot house um, with an orchard and a huge vegetable garden. The land got sold off, and there's houses there now. Um, and my mum's house is gone, and there's a monster house there, as we call them. Um, but uh, we kept it, my mum even kept a vegetable garden after the land was sold. <clears throat> and we had a humongous freezer in the basement with a lot of homegrown veggies and mum's really good baking. I went to Nate. Um, and took biosciences, and I majored in pollution control, now called environmental studies, and graduated in 1973. In those days, environmentalists were concerned with problems such as air pollution, water pollution, 
uh, herbicides, pesticides, and the like, uh, things people could see and smell and not deny their existence. Um, as a woman, I couldn't find a job in the field. It's sort of a long story, but it started with my first job interview um, after I graduated, and the interviewer asked me where I was going to go to the bathroom and when I was out in the field with a bunch of men. There was only two women in my class, but I didn't have an answer. I hadn't even thought of it. Anyway, I became a secretary, and uh, uh, I've lost myself here. And then I went into nursing, so I never did work in the field. Uh, then I sort of found, well, when, when I was at Nate, I found alcohol and drugs and consumer spending and all my environmental concerns took a back seat. Fast forward to the mid 80s when I was clean and sober and thinking about social justice and in the environment again. I met and married Bruce and we bought our first house. I immediately established an organic veggie garden and took up a bunch of lawn to establish a rock garden and flower beds. I ended up on the board of the Edmonton Horticultural Society and while there established the Goro program with the Edmonton Food Bank, Edmonton's Food Bank, encouraging people to put an extra row in their garden or use their excess veggies and fruit for donation to the food bank. There wasn't a lot of support for the program within the ranks of the society, but just enough that it took off. And it really helped that Marjorie Benz at the food bank knew how to attract media attention. So there was lots of support from the media, the community, the major garden centers, and uh, including even Rona um, and the Canadian Peat Moss Association. And this is the first moment, well, I mentioned if I'd known then what I know now, <laughs> I would have refused support from the Peat Moss Association because they're basically just a non-renewable resource like oil and gas that humans are exploiting for their own purposes and disregarding the loss of the peatlands effect on the ecosystems and global warming. Peatlands are just 3% of the Earth's surface, but store about 30% of all the land-based carbon. Anyway, the first launch of the program was in our backyard with the mayor, and the next one was with Lois Hole. And after that, I went to the city and got a bed at the Matart Conservatory for the Gororo Garden, and it's still there. Um, the, each year we had a launch covered by the media with Lois Hole or the current mayor, or uh, if they weren't available, a city councillor. And then Jim Hole came to the last few that I was involved with, along with some children who would plant some bean seeds for the cameras. Um, Clean it green at compost, you know, the ones where you see the compost sale signs around town in the spring, they came on and on board and um, they supplied supply free compost to the Matart garden, a lot of the community gardens in the city. And uh, they really helped us with compost sales. We had one over in Park Allen and we had one in the backyard here. After I found and joined Westwood, I got Mitch and my hubby to build some raised beds for the Girl Row program on the east side by the alley. We no donated a lot of kilograms of produce from those raised beds. There were a few children at the church at that time and they helped to do the planting and harvesting and uh, we did some teaching in that. We used a version of square foot gardening where we turned the soil over every fall completely, you know, we started at one end and went to the other and turned it all over. And so that's another, if I had known then what I know now moment. Um, we're now using um, uh, no-till gardening. Uh, it's uh, where you don't disturb the soil and you top it with compost, a little bit of compost every year and mulch, mulch, mulch. It uses a lot less work and way much less water, really important in this day and age with the droughts that are happening. Um, and Mike and Rita built the current raised beds at the back and we continue to grow produce for the program there. Somewhere in this period, I took a, the course and became a master composter recycler. 
which is why I became sort of the compost police at Westwood. <laughs> Sorry, fellow gardeners. <laughs> I prefer active composting to passive composting. So that was a bone of contention in the gardens <laughs> the last few years. Because I loved gardening, but had moved into apartment living, I took on the Westwood flower beds as well. I got lots of help from members in the garden, expanding the established flower beds, digging new beds, trying out new and different perennials. I find I'm at my most serene when I'm planting the garden, pulling weeds, planting, harvesting, doing anything in the garden. Also, when I stand back and look at what we've accomplished, I can feel proud and I'm really grateful for the opportunities given to me here at Westwood. I love when church members and friends and neighbors or church renters stop by to tell me how much they like the garden. And they steal a lot of raspberries too. Um, many ask for gardening advice, which I gladly give. As I'm aging, I've been cutting back on my social justice activities. I used to attend teach-ins, rallies, marches, parades, and workshops about many different social justice issues. Some weeks I'd be attending two or three events all on different issues. I even took a two-day course on how to protect myself from the police at social justice events before going to the G6B in Calgary to, to protest the G8, um, along with a whole bunch of other Westwoodians and people from the Northside Church. Um, now I've had to make some decisions, not only about what issues to support financially, but more importantly, what to support with my time and energy. And I think if I found the best idea for me, and that is working to deal with the climate change by becoming a sustainable gardener here at Westwood. It combines my social justice and environmental leanings with doing what I love, gardening. The last few years, many in the environmental movement have been identifying that plant and animal extinctions and loss of biodiversity is a huge problem for humans and may lead to environmental disaster. Another realization is that indigenous ways of taking care of the earth were much more sustainable and better for the environment. Uh, as evidenced by our uh, indigenous speaker series, Westwood's kind of been at the forefront of the, in the reconciliation movement. And since last year, I've done a lot of research and taken many classes and webinars on indigenous ecology, native prairie gardens, and native pollinators. And now I know that using native plants in our gardens will help in returning that biodiversity and it can mitigate the effects of climate change. To that end, I'm intending on removing all the non-native plants from this garden, the flower garden, and replace them with native plants. It's another, um, if I know then what I know now moments, I spent a lot of money on buying perennials. <laughs> Wish I had now. Uh, where am I? Uh, the native plants have more subtle flowers. They're not as showy as the non-native ones. So I'm probably the, the compliments are going to be scarcer. But uh, my conscience tells me it's the right thing to do. Um, I also wanted to get rid of the lawn at Westwood, which is more weeds and invasive stuff than uh, uh, grass. Um, and I did some research and I'm settled on native yarrow because it's mowable. Um, I mean, it's a tall plant, but it's mowable and it's really soft underfoot, even better than grass. So we can still have outdoor events. Um, oh, I've lost my place again. I've got a whole bunch of yarrow seeds sprouting in seed trays on my dresser in a south-facing window. Probably about 160. <laughs> uh, if they survive, um, uh, they can be planted in areas where volunteers, uh, I hope you remember who you are, Dean. <laughs> Jacqueline, <laughs> Carmen, <laughs> um, and anybody else who wants to help. Um, we're going to pull out the dandelions, the creeping Charlie that I introduced. It's got pretty 
pretty little um, purple flowers, and I encouraged it. Um, but that's another, if I'd known then what I know now moment, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, there's some perennials that have escaped the flower beds and some other invasive weeds uh, from the front lawn. If the first batch works and I don't have to purchase yarrow plants, then I may sprout another batch for the back and the east side lawns. Can't do it all in one year. Um, and so I'll do that either this summer or next year, depending on my time and how many volunteers there are and uh, my inclination, I guess. I've told, I'm told that many people with native yards get complaints from neighbors as the native prairie gardens look a little messy. I found some organizations that provide signs to indicate that these are gardens for our native pollinators. So hopefully that will cut down on complaints and perhaps educate people so they will ask how they can do it themselves. I know uh, <laughs> Alfred has one of those gardens and he doesn't get complaints much anymore, but he did in the beginning. Um, I just got a, a did you know thing here. Did you know Canada has no native honeybees? I didn't. There's a, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 species of bees in Canada and between three and 400 in Alberta. Honeybees are all purchased and brought to Canada by honey producers and those farmers that use them to pollinate their monoculture crops. Honeybees are not good for our native bees at all. Uh, they take the food. Um, and so I'm going to do quite a bit, uh, if I can, to um, produce flowers so that the honeybees or the native bees have them here. Um, and hopefully no honeybees will come from hives somewhere. Anyway, I joined a bunch of organizations to educate myself about plants and pollinators. I've got a list of them on some papers at the back of the room that you can take or take pictures of, and those online can email me at grounds at westwood.ca. And I've also got some local suppliers um, on the back page. I've investigated bees and butterflies, of course, but moths and their caterpillars, birds, flies, wasps, bats, and even small mammals are great pollinators too. I'm going to put in a couple of bird baths and some insect watering bowls, as they need a source of water too. Last year, I found great pleasure in watching and taking photos of the many pollinators hanging around Westwood's garden. I sometimes would spend an hour and then tell Bruce I was busy when I got home <laughs> because I was investigating the, the pollinators. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to get them to pose for me too, but they weren't particularly attractive, so I didn't get that many very good pictures. I often didn't know what they were, or in the case of butterflies, I didn't know which they were. Um, so I checked out Insects of Alberta and the Alberta Native Bee Council on Facebook. And you can just put a picture up and there's experts there that tell you the common name and the Latin name and, and they don't make you, I, they didn't make me feel bad for being so ignorant. I didn't learn all that stuff. Last, well, quite a few years ago, um, I and a vegetarian and a humane meat eater were asked to talk about our food choices. And I, I'm a, a vegan, and um, so I became vegetarian for the environment 20, 30 years ago. And 10 years ago, I became vegan for the animals. And I said that I hoped that my granddaughter and great nieces would know that I did my best to leave the earth better than I found it, that I took positive actions for the environment. To tell you the truth, I really didn't hold out much hope for humanity remaining on Earth. Even now, I sometimes despair for what my relatives' children's lives are going to be like when I'm gone. Not much has changed since then, except that global warming is showing its effects right here in Alberta. But still, most people aren't taking actions to reduce it, especially our provincial governments doing everything they can to line the pockets of the oil industry while wreaking havoc on most provinces. Most of the province citizens in their pocketbooks, they don't seem to understand 
that the effects of global warming will cost so much more than the short-term financial boost to the oil company's coffers. And in the long run, will make the earth unlivable for humans, including their own descendants. They don't want the inconvenience of changing their spending habits, diets, hobbies, work, or lifestyles to make the worth livable for future generations. I don't do any of the environmental stuff perfectly, far from it, but I try to consciously think about the long-term effects when I'm making purchases and, and you know, considering my behaviors. I had a whole list of things that I do poorly at, but don't have the time to tell you <laughs> the whole list. Um, one thing that's bothering me right now is that most of the guardian supplies are in plastic. You know, all the soils and, and that kind of stuff. Since I've been running the last few weeks, one of the ways I lift my spirits and become more hopeful about the environmental situation is to listen to What on Earth. It's a CBC podcast that presents positive solutions to environmental problems from around the world. I highly re recommend checking it out. And then this last week, I found another CBC podcast called 10 Minutes to Save the Planet. And the two episodes I listened to were really good. Something short and gives actionable activities that are easy to do, and they really don't preach or say that they do it all perfectly. Um, I'm going to, I've made a point now, I'm going to listen to it, one of those every morning just to get it onto my, into my radar, you know. Um, I'm going to start this week working in Westwood's garden, watering, mulching the veggie gardens, maybe weeding the paths and putting bark chips on them. I won't disturb the flower gardens as I know that the bees and other insects are still using it, them until it gets warmer. I anticipate that I'll start sleeping better, I'll feel more relaxed, more focused when I need to be, and be generally happier. That's what gardening does for me. If you want to join me in volunteering, just give me a call or a text, no commitments necessary. I'm happy for the company and to share the benefits of gardening with others. I've left some newsletters and bits of information from my binder for you to look at at the table at the back. Please don't take them. Um, we're going to plant some seeds today. One is a heritage lettuce seed that you can grow in a pot on your windowsill. Um, and then if you, when it's really going, you can leave it on your windowsill and harvest, or you can put it in your garden. The other seed I've got is uh, a flax seed or a native flax seed, and it's called Linum lewisii. It's a drought-tolerant perennial that I'm told may produce flowers in its first year, but not guaranteed. Um, you can plant it in your yard if you have one, or give it to someone with a yard, or just plant it on the edge of a park or a wilderness, wilderness area. Once it sprouts and gets a few leaves, you can transfer it very carefully to a larger pot until it's big enough to plant outside. And you should harden it off, though, putting it outside in the shade or light sun during the day at first, and then overnight for a week or two until it gets used to the weather. Um, I've got a, the, the choir has got it all set up there for us to do that. And um, I thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Oops.
Hello, today we're planting a local seed, you know, to grow what our local neighbors need. You'll each get a little seed and pot, and from the dirt rises a deed well sought. A miracle rises from dirt below. Is that where we've come? If so, we can grow what we need. Together we can succeed. Water is love, dirt the womb of life. May we grow towards the light without strife. Uh, Lindsay, do you have um, advice for us on how to plant our seeds, how deep and all that sort of thing? I do. The, le the lettuce seeds are tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, I've got some water here and some toothpicks, and you can. I'm going to put them out on a plate, and you can just kind of get a few to stick to your toothpick, and try to put three or four in your pot and uh, just kind of put a, one layer of soil on top, not very much at all. It's supposed to be the, the depth of the seed. And um, then uh, you can spray it with water. Uh, the soil's moist to start with, but you can spray the top with the water from the thing there. And there's labels to put them on. The other seeds are a tiny bit bigger, but same idea. Just cover them very lightly with the soil and uh, put them in a warm place. If you want, you can put them in, I brought some Ziploc bags, you can put them in that to kind of make a little greenhouse. And uh, it will uh, keep them warmer and help them grow. And then when they get, oh, like this high with a couple layers of leaves, then you can put them in a larger pot and very carefully take them out to not disturb the roots and put them in a larger pot. And uh, then it may be a larger pot and then maybe the garden.
Can you play really soft? Hello. Um, I forgot to mention the growing conditions. Um, lettuce needs to be in a cool area uh, so that it, uh, it, it doesn't like to get hot sun or anything. Um, so if you plant it, plant it sort of a place that gets just a couple hours of sun or in the shade. And the flax really grows nicely in the sun, but it also grows in part shade. So if you get about four hours of sun in the spot, it'll work and they'll flower. Well, that was fun. <laughs> um, I'm going to finish our service now. Um, and uh, please feel free to keep on planting. Don't worry about just to have one ear out for our um, closing words and our postlude. Our closing words are uh, by K. Elting Brock. It's good to have, the, have faith that our seeds will burst from the earth that our lives will keep growing, that when one season is over, another will take its place. Perhaps what makes a place holy and what fills us with grace is that which teaches us to have faith. For me, my garden is that place. <laughs>